All right, members, we're going to get uh, started today. We don't have enough for a quorum yet, but uh, we'll get started with hearing Representative Gottwald's bill, House File 1166. Representative Gottwald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you in that seat. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, House File 1166, I realize we can't officially move it yet, um, but this is a really important bill in light of the discussions we've been having uh, here and in the Reform Committee on the area of health and human services on Rule 101, HMO participation or managed care aspect of state public programs. It's generated a lot of interest uh, both last session and this session. And uh, this really talks about us if we, if we really don't like managed care, don't like our HMOs uh, providing managed care under our state programs, uh, this is the bill you want to sign on to. Uh, because this removes them from the obligation uh, to provide services uh, to people on state public programs. Um, got a couple of people here to testify on it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's really fairly simple, but before we do that, um, I would like to move the DE1 amendment, which gets the bill into the, uh, the condition that uh, we'd like to have it in. Um, it removes... Uh, uh, the state requirement for HMOs in the first section then adds the second section, uh, which is a repealer of the mandatory HMO participation um, as a provider in public programs. So this is the full boat. And I would encourage, uh, well, I can't move it yet, can I? Hmm. Okay. Well, we will talk, we'll, we'll speak to the DE1 amendment. Um, and again, members, this is, uh, uh, along with the conversation about whether or not we have for-profit or non-profit HMOs and other providers, uh, this again raises the whole issue of do we do we want to continue to require HMOs to be part of our public programs? Are we getting what we think we need from them, or do we want to cut them loose? Um, and uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think uh, we'll bring up our first testifier. Okay. Please state your name and who you represent for the record, and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Commit, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, uh, an association that represents Minnesota's seven nonprofit health plans. Um, you heard this bill last year, so I'll be brief uh, in my comments, but there is growing interest among um, and support among a variety of stakeholders, including the HMOs, to explore new payment models in state public programs. Um, for example, last session, or last year, I should say, DHS came forward with the healthcare delivery demonstration project, as well as the competitive bidding that was, um, that was done for the seven county metro area. And there are similar, similar provisions in, um, that have been considered since then. Um, as a result of that, we believe that the requirement on health plans uh, mandating them to participate in state public programs is a barrier to achieving a more robust and innovative marketplace and um, precludes the opportunity to test alternative payment arrangements. <clears throat> Competitive bidding in state public programs is certainly one alternative payment approach that should be explored and the elimination of the mandate is an important step towards these new models. You, I, I just want to add as well that eliminating the mandate does not mean that my member health plans would not continue to participate in state, pub state public programs. In fact, on the contrary, Minnesota's health plans are not fearful of new payment and delivery models. The health plans have been at the forefront of payment and delivery initiatives, such as pay for performance, gain sharing, accountable care partnerships, incorporation of health care homes into provider networks, and much more. As you know, the health plans are nonprofit, mission driven organizations. They want to continue to work with state public programs and look forward to competing under many different models. However, competitive bidding just won't work when there is mandated participation. Partic passage of this bill is necessary as the state transitions to many new forms of care delivery and alternative payment models. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for Ms. Schmidt. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Commit. Um, under the the proposal, you know, you in, in your testimony suggests that uh, you don't believe any of the health plans would uh, back away, or they may not back away. But what I'm curious about is 
um, if, for instance, a Blue Cross Blue Shield decided they didn't want to participate anymore because they're not required to, and they provide uh, a lot of the network in greater Minnesota, um, what would be the impact of the enrollees um, in greater Minnesota if uh, this became the law and there wasn't something uh, to which uh, those enrollees would transition to? Ms. Commit. Mr. Chair and Representative Murphy, um, I think that what this bill is attempting to do is to um, make this a, a more competitive marketplace by removing this requirement, removing the handcuffs, if you will, of having to <coughs> bid. Um, everybody has to bid, everyone, all of my members had to bid on the, um, in the competitive bidding arrangement, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't really a true competitive bid because they're all required to do that. So I think that, um, if in the in this uh, scenario you're suggesting if there were a health plan that would pull out and I, I don't know that first of all we don't talk about that but if a health plan were to decide for whatever reason to do that it certainly would be a, um, a, a business opportunity for other health plans um, to gain more market share or develop fuller uh, further develop their products to be able to compete in that area. So I think it's, you know, that happens today in the regular marketplace. And so to the extent that people would be able to, or other companies could um, market or compete for that business, I think that you would see that happen. Well, Representative Murphy. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Ms. Commit, or, or to Representative Gawalt. Um, the, the question I have is about the enrollees and their ability to access meaningful care if that hypothetical situation were to occur. Well, um, Ms. Commit. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Murphy, um, again, my health plans are uh, nonprofit, mission driven organizations. It is part of their mission to serve the community. Um, we don't talk about market share, who's going to, you know, that would be a violation of antitrust. However, um, I know that individual health plans are very competitive, particularly in the commercial market, but also in the um, state public programs, even though they're required to participate in state public programs. I really don't think that you would see any difference, um, different behavior from them. In fact, I think you'd see a more competitive uh, approach to addressing um, the serving of state, state public program enrollees. Um, Representative Gottwald, did you have a comment to that? Well, just to add, uh, Representative Murphy, you ask a very good question. You know, we, we've spent a lot of time this session already kind of castigating the, uh, the HMOs and managed care under the whole transparency discussion. Um, but I think it's also interesting to note under this bill what it would look like if, in fact, we remove managed care, remove their networks, remove their management of care, their access to care. What would that look like? What would we have to do as a state to replicate that, especially in rural areas? Um, how do we get people access to the care they need under public programs? And it's a very legitimate question to ask. I think it's the question that this bill actually begs. Um, and uh, it's part of why I've brought this bill forward both last year and this year is, is to, we, we really need to talk about um, the pros and cons of managed care and what we're getting for this. And I think access certainly is one of the things we're purchasing. One of the problems under public programs, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, that we're experiencing is we are forcing people to see uh, people under public programs and then underpaying them. Now, I don't know that that's the entire issue here, but. But this is a, a part of a bigger picture, and that's that we are, uh, we, are, we are creating situations that are simply untenable for providers and provider organizations um, under public programs with constantly balancing uh, the promises we're keeping or the promises we're making on the backs of the providers. And access is the first, uh, the first victim of that sort of situation. So it's a very good question to ask. I don't have a terribly good answer if we didn't have uh, the managed care organizations providing guaranteed access to a network of care I'm not sure what we would do and mr. chair representative Murphy thanks mr. chair and um, I appreciate the answer um, both answers to my question I will make an editorial note that we are 
uh, in part underpaying in the public programs because we continue to make great cuts in the public programs um, to, or in order to balance the budget without raising taxes. So we can set that aside. Um, but I think it's an important point. Um, I, I am as interested as I hear the testifiers and the chair of the committee uh, in these new models. Um, and I, I think it's a really important question, a fundamental question. This bill is an important one, but I am worried about passing the legislation if we don't know what the outcome for the enrollees um, will be, especially in greater Minnesota where we know the providers are spread out. And so I, uh, I appreciate, Representative Gottwald, your acknowledgement that that's not clear yet. Um, and I think it's an important um, consideration as we talk about this piece of legislation. Um, okay. Mr. Chair and Representative Murphy, um, you do raise a very important question. And but I, just to echo a little bit about a little bit of what um, Representative Gottwald said, you know, there have been um, there's been a lot of concern and worry that perhaps the state is paying health plans too much, um, and maybe one way to address that and to perhaps even save more money is to remove that requirement. It doesn't mean that nobody would come forward to compete or participate. It just means that there wouldn't be that um, fixed requirement. And um, this would be an opportunity to see if the, the program would, re would really work. And I think that we've seen, I think people were sort of surprised and, in fact, even pleased by what happened last year with the competitive bidding, that not only did um, they get some good bids, but they actually got bids where they that resulted in a savings of $275 million for the state of Minnesota. So I think there's more interest in this kind of approach that plans may not uh, turn their backs on these populations, but in fact embrace them in, in a more competitive manner. Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This is my final question, I promise. So um, uh, I have been, you know, thinking about uh, this this question and wondering if, as we're moving to these other models, um, if we would consider uh, legislation or language that would say in the absence of another arrangement, the state would pay a direct fee for service rate to providers for the enrollees care. Um, so a direct payment from the government to the provider um, to make sure that the enrollees are covered, um, that they have payment for the care that they are entitled to uh, because of state law. And so, you know, I think if we're going to move forward with this model and if we're going to consider the HMOs um, and their participation, there's got to be another way that we assure the public that their care is going to be covered and paid for so that they have access. So my question is, would that be a potential bridge um, to the future from your perspective? Representative Gottwald. Representative Gottwald. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the question, Representative Murphy. I, clearly, I think that's important. Obviously, we, you know, you can't just pull the rug out and not, not have something to back it up. And I know the department is here to speak to this as well. Um, we've had uh, some ongoing conversations about these kinds of things. But I, I don't know if, the, if a direct fee for service is the right way to go. Um, part of the reason I think we contracted with managed care way back when was, was to manage the care, provide uh, high quality, cost effective services without uh, having so much expense that we wouldn't be able to cover it. Um, in a sense, going back to fee-for-service might be one way to, uh, if the HMOs were, were out of the mandate to provide care to people, but it would also get us back on what we tried to move away from originally. So I think it does require some more thought, and I think you've kind of alluded to that. But I, I, I don't know if the department wants to, wants to come up now, but I know they do plan to testify on it. All right, uh, before we get to Representative Liebling, we'll call the meeting officially to order. And Representative Gottwald, if you want to move your bill and your DE amendment. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll move that House File 1166 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the General Register. That's amended? Um, well, we haven't amended it yet. All right. All right. So um, I'll make that motion first, and then I will uh, um, I'll also move the DE1. The D1 amendment puts the bill in the in the shape that we wanted in, as I presented earlier. So I'll make that motion now. All right. Any discussion to the D1, Representative Liebling? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, th I think more or less we've been discussing the DE1, and that'd be great if we can continue that before it's adopted. 
Um, and, and my question really is kind of twofold, and one of them is directly to the to the uh, DE one. But let me ask the other one first, and that is a uh, um, oh, Ms. Commit kind of sat down there. Maybe she could get come back though and answer this for me. I understand that under federal law, we're required to have more than one plan available for our participants to choose from, right? More in metropolitan areas and fewer in rural areas. And so I'm just wondering, you know, it, well, let me make sort of a statement and you can respond to it. It seems to me then with, when that's in place, if we then say that the plans don't have to participate, we're potentially putting ourselves as a state in a really bad bargaining position because we've got to have X number and, and then they don't have to run for the job, if you will. So could you comment on that, please? Ms. Commit. Yes, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling. Um, you know, and DHS will be able to speak to this, these specifics a little bit better than I can, but this is, um, Every state has their own Medicaid program in, and they have to follow the federal requirements, um, but they can all shape them a little bit differently based on their, the wants and needs of that particular state. And in Minnesota, what we did was apply for a waiver, and as part of that waiver, um, was able to contract with health plans to um, provide the coverage of these um, state public programs to enrollees, because at the time this went into effect, the state and the legislature determined that this was a better approach. Um, so you are correct that I think one of the requirements in order for that waiver to be in place is that um, in metropolitan statistical areas, um, they have to have more than one health plan, typically two health plans available. But if this goes away, and again, DHS can speak to this a little bit better than I can if, if that were to go away, then um, I think to Representative Murphy's um, earlier comment, it, the, the underlying or existing state Medicaid program still exists so that um, you'd still have a fee-for-service model in place and if the, if the waiver is not being used anymore, then the existing um, state Medicaid program would be in place. Okay. Uh, Representative Liebman, would you like us to call Scott Lights down? No. no. Uh, well, not right away. I, I've okay. got a second part to my. All right. Thank All you, right. Mr. Go Chair. Ahead. And so, thank you, Ms. Commit. And then, to Representative Gottwald, I wanted to bring up a question about the uh, the amendment, and that is, I see that in the amendment you're leaving out the section of the bill that's on lines 3.28 to 3.32, and part of that is the commissioner shall provide services under the request for proposal process through a state operated option. So in your bill here, you're with your amendment, you're removing the requirement that there be a state-operated option. And I, I guess I'd like to know why you're doing that, because my feeling is if we were going to move away from this, I mean, it makes some conceptual sense to me that we should stop requiring plans to provide, to bid. It makes some conceptual sense to me. At the same time, it makes conceptual sense to me. These are our patients. This is our money. And we also should be able to do it ourselves. We should be able to build capacity in the state agencies to be our own HMO for our own patients or to do it through counties, as we're already doing in many areas. So I'm wondering why you're taking that out in your DE amendment. Representative Gottwald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling, thank you for the question. I think you know why this bill is here and, and what discussion it's designed to generate. but. Uh, part of the reason for this is that we don't believe that it has to be um, a state-operated option, that in fact we could work with the private marketplace in a more competitive environment to deliver high-quality, low-cost services. Um, that's a philosophical difference we may have, and I suspect we'll hear from the department on that as well. Um, but that's part of why we took that, uh, took that section out uh, for purposes of the bill at this point. Senator Liebling. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gottwald, for being uh, so open about that because frankly, you know, so what I see, what I'm going to sort of paraphrase what I hear you saying, maybe you won't like my paraphrase, I don't know, you can, you're quite capable of letting me know that if you don't. Are but, you asking me to comment but, on that, <laughs> Chair Representative Lee? <laughs> um, so uh, what I hear you saying is, you know, we're going to not, we're going to, um, we're going to, um, tell these private entities, the HMOs, that they don't, they don't have to bid for our business anymore. 
and we're just going to find some other private entities to come and bid for our business if they don't want to. But we ourselves can't do this ourselves. And, you know, I frankly, I, I think um, if we're going to try, we, we've had this grand experiment with the HMOs for a number of years. We kind of know, well, maybe we don't exactly know where that went. We're, gonna, we're trying to find out how, how that's done for us. Um, and you want to try some other sort of experiments with the private sector, but you're not open, it seems, to, to doing it, to taking our public sector patients who are paid for with public sector money and having them in a program in the public sector, unless it's just fee-for-service. Is that kind of summing up your position? Representative Gottwald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling, no, it, it really isn't a very fair uh, um, summary of what I, what I said at all. What I think we're doing in this bill is it, it's interesting. We've had a lot of discussion about HMOs, managed care. You called it the experiment that goes way back uh, uh, to the 90s and even earlier. Um, and the question becomes, do we force HMO organizations in the state of Minnesota to be part of these programs or don't we? And if we open it up, do we allow other entities, including HMOs, to compete on perhaps a competitive bidding process? Um, what we have said is it doesn't have to be a state-mandated, state-operated program. Um, now, clearly, if these people are receiving public benefits, there's a funding stream that's public. So in that term, I, I think the state is involved. Um, but I, I think what we're trying to say is it doesn't mean that the state has to dictate all the terms and force the HMOs to be part of it under this bill. Um, I think Ms. Commit just spoke recently to an idea that, you know, perhaps a more open-ended competitive bidding process would be more appropriate. Um, I'll be real honest. I'm a bit agnostic about it. I think this is a this is a very important policy discussion which belongs in this committee about whether or not we continue down the road we're on, or whether we open things up more and do that, or maybe there's a third option. Um, but it is an important discussion, and uh, it certainly has come up much more in this session than any previous session I've experienced uh, about whether or not it makes sense for us to continue down the path we're on. So that's, that's really the intent of opening it up by removing that paragraph. Representative Liebling. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Gowell, and I'm glad you're a little bit uh, ag agnostic on that, but I, I guess I feel like if we're going to have this, if we are going to open it up, I don't know why we wouldn't open it up to see whether we need to contract through private entities at all and whether we, you know, let, let a public option be in the competitive mix. I don't know why we wouldn't do that. And, you know, I, I guess uh, what I hear you saying is you're not totally opposed to that, but yet you're taking that out, and you're, you're taking that out here. And I guess I, um, I guess I'd like to see that um, put back. Representative Gottwald. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, I apologize if I wasn't clear about that. I'm not agnostic on that issue, and that's part of why I've put it in the bill the way I have, is that I actually do favor a more private, open approach. I believe that rather than a top-down government approach, which I think, in fact, through our experiment and through other things, is proving that we can't deliver it uh, with as high a quality or as low a cost, that uh, we ought to be trying a different route, and that's part of why I, I removed the paragraph. I'm more agnostic on the issue, the issue of whether or not we, we, we strap managed care to this permanently or even force other providers. There's, there was some question early on about whether or not we would include other providers in this bill and exempt them from participation. Uh, participation in the public programs. Um, we're starting with the HMOs, uh, mainly because that's where the biggest questions have been. Um, but I think we really need to uh, we really need to decide how do we want to do this in the future. And I, I frankly think that a more open process might be in order. We've started doing competitive bidding through the state. Uh, that seems to have borne some fruit uh, with regard to cost savings. So, um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Representative Liebling. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, thanks for the discussion, Representative Gowald. I think, you know, when you want to talk about, you know, top-down government can't do it, I mean, the best, uh, you know, maybe you don't like Medicare, but I mean, that's certainly a top-down, or the VA, top-down government-run health care. Here we're talking about health care that's paid for by government. No question about it. We're talking about public patients, state and federal money. And, um, you know, so you're not going to get the government. It is a, the government program. And so, um, and we're not talking about providers being government providers. We're just talking about the government doing the, the, uh, the payment functions and the, the managed care function. We're not talking about providing the care even as they do in the VA system so successfully. 
We're just talking about we're the payer. So in a, if you will, it's a single payer for this group of people, namely us, you, me, and, and, having, and doing this building capacity in a way that we manage it, where we see that where we, it's totally transparent because to the degree that we are transparent. And um, anyway, I, I think that that really needs to be in the mix. If we're talking about really upsetting the apple cart here and moving to a different system, I don't see why that system couldn't kind of compete <coughs> along with the others. So that's my, I'll stop there. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, I'll just, you know, you, you have underscored the difference in philosophy here. Um, there are some who believe that public funding to assist people with their medical needs is different than public funding that is tied to all of government running the entire thing from top to bottom, mandating benefits, mandating coverages, mandating who will deliver it and how. And as for transparency, I think we've had some real <laughs> challenges with that on the public side, not, uh, not on the private side so much. So uh, there is a difference of philosophy here on this, and, and, and that's why I've got this in my bill. And you know, if, if you wanted to bring a bill that said it should be single payer, um, that would be fine too. Uh, next on the list is Representative Loeffler. Did you want to speak to this, or did you want us to adopt the amendment first? Um, well, I can do either one. I wanted to ask some questions of the witness. So, okay. Well, if we can adopt the amendment first, get the bill in order, then. Um, okay. Then, all of those in favor of the DE one amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, say nay. No. All right, the <coughs> amendment is adopted. Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Ms. Commit, um, you know, you made reference to, you know, that the HMOs are, or the health plans are nonprofit, mission oriented entities. And, you know, the heart of this bill is whether or not that should be the primary mechanism by which we deliver medical assistance to large parts of, of Minnesota, or whether there should be some other. Um, approach and you know I'm wondering if you might just talk a little bit about what you think has been the added value of the health plans in their service to this particular prop population because I have always felt and I believe I've heard you articulate very effectively um, the added value that HMOs bring to the delivery and care coordination of this population if you could just kind of remind us why health plans have been the model of choice since um, the early pilots in the, the mid-80s. Ms. Commit? Mr. Chairman and Representative, um, yes, Minnesota's health plans, we think we've brought a lot of value to the state Medicaid program. This program was started um, as a pilot program back in the mid-1980s, and by 1996 it was expanded to be statewide. What really led to this was um, difficulty that the legislature began to hear about and probably DHS as well where people uh, who were on medical assistance had difficulty finding providers who would treat them in particular um, pregnant moms couldn't find an OBGYN to deliver their babies um, because they they just weren't available to that population and what as managed care began to grow and become more popular across the country and in Minnesota, the state made um, a decision. It started as a small pilot program, but expanded to um, take this statewide and have all of these, well, mostly moms and kids and um, other populations later on, Minnesota Care, go through, um, get their care through a health plan. And the reason for that was health plans have networks, they credential providers, they make sure they have just the right number of providers in their network, not too many, not too few. Um, they make sure they have an adequate, high quality number of providers in their network. They, they handle all the claims, they pro provide a call center to answer questions, they take care of all of those details. Um, that, so the, the state doesn't have to do that. And for a fee, they would pay the health plans to do all of those things as well as take on the risk. And that's important because the state or the legislature could then um, appropriate a set dollar amount to, for, for this program to the health plans, knowing that 
if the costs were a little bit more that year, so be it. The health plans would have to um, make up the loss somehow. Likewise, if they were a little more effective in managing the care better or through underwriting cycles, they didn't have as much demand or utilization, they might have a little bit left over, that would be okay too. So that's the, that's the direction that the state, both the state and the legislature went into um, years ago. And we think that that um, approach has served the public well because we have the um, leverage to, to achieve lower rates with our providers because those providers are part of our commercial um, networks, they, uh, we use those um, networks to, um, for the people on state public programs as well. And so that really um, eliminated basically the access problem for people. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, one of the reasons Minnesota's uninsured rate is so low uh, is it due in part to the, um, the ability for people to get their health care through a managed care plan. But I also know that over the past few years, there's been a, there have been a lot of questions, there have been some comments made, um, people are not so sure about that program anymore. And if that is in fact the case, then it's really a policy decision for the legislature and the state to make as to whether or not the way we've been doing it still serves the population, still meets the needs of um, the legislature and the state as a whole. And we would just argue that if, in fact, this isn't working for the state, then release us from this requirement. And at the same time, with the competitive bidding from last year, I think we got to see how it possibly could work through a competitive bidding model that um, uh, not only could access be maintained or even improved, but money could be saved on behalf of the state. So there are a number of reasons why we think this has worked. We think we've provided good value, budget stability, budget predictability. I mean, you didn't have to come back into session if there was a, um, if we ran out of money and come back and appropriate more money. So we think that we've helped, we've been a good partner to the state. Um, but if that partnership isn't working for the state anymore, then let's look at decoupling that arrangement and, um, and going in a different direction. All right, I think Mr. Lightswood has some uh, comments to make on this as well, and so if he could make his way down. Well, Mr. Chair, if I could just continue my line of reasoning, we can hear from the department as okay, well. Representative Offler. Um, but I do feel like I agree with uh, Ms. Commit on many of the advantages that, that were hoped and expected to happen with managed care. And, um, and my fear is that many of those things that um, Ms. Kmit just outlined um, will, will come back to haunt us in terms of lack of access and inefficient system in which there's too few providers in some areas and too many in others and um, that uh, people, pregnant moms and de people who need dental care and other things will not have access um, and that, you know, the call center coordination, those sorts of things that we have, I think, universally done. It feels to me like, um, all of that is potentially put at risk if all HMOs have the ability to say, well, we just don't like what you're asking us to bid on, so we're walking away. And it feels a little bit like just because <coughs> questions have been raised about the finances, not about the care delivery, not about the other things that you just outlined, but the questions have been about the finances. But now that the finances are being scrutinized more seriously, that, well, we don't want to play the game anymore because we had a, a good deal and now we don't want to. And yet we're putting, I think, at risk the individuals who are counting on that. And um, the language that has been used um, about this provides a more competitive market to me is just the opposite. Um, if you have everybody in the game competing with each other or you could, you have only two providers, um, you don't have much leverage and there isn't much competition. Um, but I have a few other questions I'd like to follow up with Ms. Commit, but if, if, if the department would like to comment on that particular point, I think that would be good. Um, Mr. Chair um, and um, Scott Lights uh, with the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Um, Representative Loeffler, uh, let, me, let me just back up and say a couple things. First of all, I think um, uh, Ms. Commit actually did a really nice summary mm -hmm. of the historic reasons that we did 
um, move to managed care. And we do believe that it has brought very good access to folks around the state, particularly um, as was pointed out in rural areas of the state where it can be difficult, and you see this in other states, for uh, persons who are um, on Medicaid program to find access to services, necessary services in those areas. I would also say, Representative Lawford, we share your concern that if we were to remove this requirement, that some of those um, same concerns that led us to go this direction might actually um, return in that direction. So um, I would say that I would agree with both of the previous speakers, uh, Representative Law, for the points that you were making, as well as I think um, Ms. Commit captured very well the historic reasons why we did um, go move this in this direction. And I would say that the department, um, while we are, uh, I think, changing our purchasing models, because we do believe that they were somewhat outmoded, and as the commissioner has testified before this committee before, we believe that there uh, was money being left on the table. Uh, I think we were able to demonstrate that um, competitive bidding and this requirement actually live very well in tandem together. All the plans submitted bids. Uh, they were competitive. Um, and in the end, uh, it resulted in a savings of about $175 million. And so we do believe that these, those two things can live actually very well together um, while continuing to bring the good access that Minnesota should be rightfully proud of. Representative Gottwald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Re Representative Loeffler, I think it I think actually you misrepresent a little bit. This isn't just about finances. I mean, if, if you heard the hearing, uh, we took out the lead pipe on HMOs, and uh, we heard testimony that went far beyond finances. Um, and, and that is exactly why this bill is here. If we believe that model is broken, if we believe that HMOs are not the way of delivering care for public programs, if we have all the concerns and heartburn that we heard, uh, this bill is the opportunity to look at something different. That's what it is. It's an opportunity to look at something different. And um, I respect what you're saying, but the, the argument comes time and again. Um, well, it's just the finances. So if we lock down the finances, if we force the HMOs to do things under our terms financially, then we'll guarantee people access and high quality care um, and management of their care, and we'll do it for the price that we think we can afford. Promises we can't keep with money we don't have. And I think that's a bit disingenuous. So, I mean, this bill is, you want to talk about transparency, this is the ultimate transparency. Mr. All right, Chair? members, just uh, for our uh, information, we are going to be voting on this at 2.15. The other bills that were on the agenda for today will be moved to another day, just so we know where we're at. Representative Loeffler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do support the innovations that we are doing. We're moving in terms of accountable care, cost. I mean, I think those are just like in 1985. This was a pilot project involving three of our 87 counties. We ought to look at any new experiments as pilot projects. Mm -hmm. And this is a sweeping reform of the entire system. Um, and I think we could end up with a situation which we're all going to get calls from lots of people on medical assistance who can't get access because we've had that even in the recent past with dental insurance where people have called every dentist in the phone book and it was only when their <coughs> HMO um, or health plan intervened that they were actually able to get an appointment even though they had that state-issued MA card. And so I think we do really legitimately need to, to deal with the access. Um, but the other th question I had for you, Ms. Commit, was that you, know, you mentioned how it's a nonprofit mission oriented entities, and I think that's a strength of your system and it has served us well. Um, and I know that only a small portion of your business is, is, as I understand it, is with the for profit sector in your nonprofit business. And um, that potentially would be at risk. But I would also like you to understand, share with us, what do you think you would be doing then if you aren't serving public program people, which I have always interpreted as part of that mission, and why we set up a special HMO or health plan statute in the law was that you got that advantage, the competitive advantage, not having for-profit competitors in this state, because you were serving our lowest paid and highest need populations. And that was a major contributor to your being a nonprofit mission oriented entity. And what would you think would be that purpose, that mission, that, that payback to the community for that nonprofit status if an HMO were to choose not to bid to serve our MA clients um, or Minnesota Care or the other managed care populations. What would you see as the, the reason that they should be, be able to defend their tax exempt status then? Ms. Commit. Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler, 
I can't speak for what the, each individual health plan's board of directors would determine um, the direction for their, uh, their organization. However, I can assure you that none of my health plans are for-profit entities. Even though they have um, a license under 62D, which is the HMO statute, they also have a license under 62A, which is the insurance statute, but they run their entire book of business, HMO business, all the products under their HMO license, as well as all the products under their insurance business um, in, an H, in a uh, nonprofit model base, a uh, uh, nonprofit model um, format. And they, um, y you know, there are nonprofit HMOs all over the country. What's unique about Minnesota, and I just want to remind the committee, is that Minnesota is the only state in the nation that requires all HMOs to be nonprofit and as a condition of licensure, they must contract with the state for state public programs. No other state has that requirement. So again, if you were to remove that requirement, chances are you may get interest from other states. I don't know for sure because it hasn't been that way ever since the HMO law went into existence. However, in this era of changing health care delivery and how we purchase it and how individuals on state public programs may purchase health or may access health care um, going forward, I think it behooves the, the legislature as well as the state to consider other options. And, um, you know, two of my health plans exclusively do state public programs. So, and my other health plans also have sizable um, portions of their business as state public programs, as well as <laughs> systems developed, you know, millions of dollars invested in infrastructure, in computer systems, all sorts of things in order to make this work on behalf of the state of Minnesota. I think it would be highly unlikely for them to simply um, give up and walk away. Um, not only for those reasons, but most importantly, is because they have consumer representation on their boards, and the people at the um, board level believe in serving the local community. And all of my health plan companies um, have that belief. All right, Representative Waffler, and we do have Representative Murray, uh, Murphy on the list as well in the next five minutes. Um, Thank you. Um, well, I, I don't think you answered the question I wanted you to address, which was with the community benefit of your being a nonprofit if you're not serving our medical assistance clients, because I see that as, as the, the tie. And with that, I'll yield to Ms. Murphy, because we have limited time. Representative Murphy. Uh, Ms. Commit, did you have? Oh, Mr. Chair and, and um, Representative Loeffler, if, um, if this law were to pass um, and the health plans remained as nonprofit entities, I can assure you they would continue to do whatever the requirements are um, that they have to follow in order to maintain their nonprofit health status. Um, that doesn't go away. That includes um, continuing to uh, provide services to the community in ways that are perhaps a little bit different than directly serving state public programs, but there are a variety of other um, programs that health plans engage in um, where they give back to the community. Anything with that, Representative Walker? No. Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, my question is for Commissioner Lights. I, uh, in my earlier comments, uh, asked a question about whether or not uh, a bridge mechanism to pay directly from um, uh, DHS to providers in a fee-for-service environment uh, with uh, in the absence of anything else if that is something um, that DHS could manage in addition to the other payment models that you are underway with and contemplating in the future. Mr. Lights. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Murphy, you know, if um, if it were the case that in certain areas of the state because the requirement were lifted that um, plans did not participate. Uh, obviously, we would need to, we would need to create a mechanism to, to to contract on a fee for service basis with providers, and that would mean um, some replication of of, of existing uh, systems that we have that we currently contract out with the health plans to do. So, um, there would be some replication that would be necessary there, and we'd probably for a while, assuming that they're operating in some areas and not operating in some areas, would be running in a sense two parallel systems during that time period. 
Um, we obviously functionally would make it happen. It's necessary. Providers need to be paid. People have, need to have access. But I think it would uh, bring in duplication of what of what's of what's what's occurring, and would require us to create a an administrative structure that isn't may not fully be able to. Um, it isn't fully in place right now to be able to do that. So I'm not saying that, that couldn't occur and it would occur if necessity made it so, but yes, it would be some duplication of what, what's currently being done. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then just one comment for Representative Gottwald. You mentioned that this is the only bill or the bill that we should consider this, and I just want to let you know there's at least one more coming. Representative Gottwald. Well, I don't know that I, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, I don't know that, it's, that I said it was the only one. In fact, there's a whole bunch of bills floating around this legislative session that uh, propose different ways of approaching these things. But um, at some point, we have to decide if the model we're currently working under is the one we want. Um, if it is not, what model do we want to operate under? Um, I, I think, as, as Mr. Leitz and Ms. Commit have testified to today, uh, there are other models being explored, both in state government and, uh, and in other areas. Um, so it's 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 a great discussion to have here in our reform committee because reform is exactly what we need in this area. All right, Representative Gottwald, any more closing comments? All right, then would you like to renew your motion to take House File 1166 as amended and send it to the General Register? I would renew that motion, yes, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, Representative Gottwald, did you uh, confer with the, the Commerce Committee? Because it's been tradition in this body for the last few years that um, insurance um, market-related bills go both to Commerce and to, to Health and Human Services. And because I like having them here, I think we ought to honor that and send ours to the Commerce <laughs> Committee as well. Um, because I think both have a serious responsibility, and I'm not being flippant, they have a serious responsibility to understand what's happening. We need to do it because of the billions that we spend on behalf of the public and rollies, but we also need to know what the impact is on the private sector. And um, a portion of this bill, lines 1.7 to 1.118, actually may impact what's available in the market in terms of um, other public employees, other people who are buying health insurance, MCHA, et cetera. And so I really think it would be appropriate for Commerce to do that. And I think the partnership between the two committees um, is something we should strengthen. So I would like you to consider referring this to the Commerce Committee. Representative Gottwald, I understand that the Commerce Committee didn't uh, request this. Well, Mr. Well. Chair and Representative Loeffler, that's true. The Commerce Committee has not requested it. They are aware of the bill. I would also point out that HMOs are regulated by the Department of Health, which is why it's here. Um, we may have issues about the, uh, uh, about the impact on the marketplace, but those would be more indirect. And I would argue that uh, because HMOs are regulated by the Department of Health, it belongs here. Representative Hosh. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Gottwald. I, I understand and I believe that you voted for a bill to have HMOs regulated by the Department of Commerce earlier this year. So maybe we, we should refer to the Department of Commerce. Um, that's a bill that this committee supported. Representative Gottwald. Well, Mr. Chair, Representative Hosh, good point. I mean, we're, we're discussing a lot of different options, but until it is, in fact, regulated by Commerce, I, I don't see any need to send it over there. All right. With that, Representative Gottwald renews his motion to send the amended House File 1166 to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Motion passes. We also have some minutes to approve before we head off for the day. Uh, anyone? Representative Hamilton moves for the minutes. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes, and with that, we are meeting tomorrow at 12.30, and we are adjourned.